In 1978, Nick Rhodes and I were founder members of Duran Duran. After I left, we met once in 1983, when I was singing Kiss Me With Your Mouth at the Danceteria in New York. Seventeen years later, a chance meeting at a Vivian Westwood event led us to return to our art school roots and also to create new music, inspired by the spirit that made us want to write and play in the first place. Without a doubt, the album that Stephen and I have made uh, as the Devils, to save any confusion, um, would have pretty much been the first Duran Duran album. There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, this was the sort of sound we had, um, and uh, those are the songs. So, so if anyone's curious, yes, this is what we used to sound like, but we don't have as much clarinet on this. But when, when, we, uh, when we first met, we actually got together very quickly and got to perform and write. Um, you know, the, the, it was, seemed so easy in 1978 to actually make the transition from wanting to be in a band to being in a band, because we just lived through the whole punk times. It, it was still very much around then in, in Birmingham in 78. And it was the first time for us, I think, that we'd seen other artists on stage that were only our age and only knew three chords too. And so it seemed possible to be up there. I, I remember watching a few of the punk bands and thinking, OK, I know D and A and F. If I but can that, that was that. easy for you because you had stickers on your keyboard. That's right, that's right. But that was at the time when I was still thinking I might play guitar. And John, in fact, played guitar in the original lineup. Uh, Stephen played bass and sung. Um, and Simon Colley, um, our chef, uh, played, uh, played bass guitar and also clarinet. Uh, and I played synthesizers and fiddled with tape recorders and rhythm units. So it was quite a bizarre sound we made, actually. Around punk times, there was um, there was an awful lot of really small venues, pubs, bars, uh, and places for new acts to play. And it was in one of these pubs that I first saw Dada. That's right. With their ironing board as a uh, keyboard stand, and a certain John Taylor playing the guitar. And as I walked to art college on the first day of term, I was very surprised to see John Taylor and the drummer from TDI walking to college. And I thought that With everybody... With the ironing board, right? They didn't have the ironing board, right. but they had, they had their portfolios. And I thought that all of Birmingham's punk community was going to be coming together, but it was only them. And the drummer was already in a band. Yeah. So I said to the other guy, what are you doing now that uh, the ironing board has been folded away? And he wasn't doing anything, so we um, we got together. That was the, uh, the birth of Duran Duran. Yeah, I mean, I mean there, was, there was a lot of other influences on our sound. I think we'd all heard the, the first Velvet Underground album quite a lot of times by then. And um, we wanted to do something that was quite radical and, and hence the lineup uh, and the sound really was pretty extreme for the time I mean when we played our show at Birmingham Barbarella's this was still the height of Birmingham punk times and I remember walking on stage and thinking oh my god it's the punk crowd they pogo they spit and occasionally they throw bottles we're walking on, wearing women's clothes. Stephen's about to announce the first song. Well, actually, I've got to start it. It's a rhythm unit. I'm going to press that little rhythm unit, and it's going to go...
So I, I pressed it and thought, well, we're here. We might as well do it. It was an instrumental. I don't know. Afterwards, they, there was polite applause, and I thought, hmm, okay, no bottles so far. This is good. And Stephen walked up to the microphone. His most fey voice said, uh, this next song is uh, influenced by uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, a writer some of you may have heard of. It's called So Cold in El Dorado. And I thought we were going to die. Also, I think that we were trying to fight off punks, uh, the, the boring bits of punk, with the lyrics. That's why we were singing about shops and, you know, anything apart from the right to work or... Yeah. The right to shop, we were saying. Yes. The as, right to shop. As punks, we demand the right to shop. And I had been too embarrassed to play my the bass when I'd gone into the second hand shop on Saltley Gate. And when I got home I found that it was a fretless bass, which made everything even more sort of slippy and slidey. It was good though, it was good for our tuning at the time, wasn't it? Because we didn't and in fact we have c carried on that lack of tuning Absolutely. into our, our electro clash work. Have to tune, or we'll really be in trouble since everything in the whole track is out of tune, aren't we? Space monks, okay, speak out. <laughs> So we started using back projection. Yes, in fact, it was uh, John's uh, or Nigel's um, geography field slides. The field trip slides, which I still have and look at every Christmas. You know, I mean, having grown up on, on Bowie and, uh, and Roxy Music too and seeing the, the immense effort that went into their live shows and the whole visual aspect, it was obvious to us that things were going to move a little bit that way. Well, we wanted to move things that way. And that's why we, we paid so much attention to the presentation. I mean, putting the posters up for the first show was very important to us. I mean, Stephen and John, you know, diligently did them at, uh, at art, art school. And, and John would sort of diligently go down and write in half an hour on it. <laughs> <laughs> Performing at, in the lecture theatre at 6.30, only 50 pence. But the posters took longer to make than the actual set. You know, the set took. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was it was very important. It was it was um, stylistically it was an interesting time too because you had all that great punk graphics, and and really that was such a stylish movement. Uh, and some people forget that it came out of Malcolm and and Vivian Westwood and. Uh, and Jamie Reed and th these people that really had great vision, um, and, and obviously a lot, a lot of incredible bands. But because it, it had turned a little um, heavier with the likes of the Angelic Upstarts and Sham 69, uh, it, it definitely swayed the movement more towards electronic things. And synthesizers were actually becoming more affordable for the first time.
be worth taking some of that. Well, we could call ourselves the tragic moment. Yeah. Tragic moment. Of which we have many. Okay, that's... Um, I think I haven't looked in Gothic today, have I? Um, the Devils, we searched actually for, for a name for a while and... Uh, okay. How about Earl of Toadstool? <laughs> <laughs> Are we called the Devils because I wanted to call us the Sea, the Sea? And that's probably one of the motivating reasons for me searching through books. Ah. Another goth classic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I pretty much worked with you know, the members of Duran Duran or the varying members of Duran Duran for, uh, you know, well, since I was 16 years old. And I have done some other outside projects, but not one where we really um, collaborated with, with such intensity. Well, it was and like a conversation, really, wasn't it? Yeah. And it, there wasn't anybody else involved. And the great thing was, after we'd finished making the album, we went on John's Geography Field Trip together. Lost Decade was the first song that we actually wrote together, and that was written in 1978. And other originals were Aztec Moon, Hawks Do Not Share, Big Store, New Haven Dieppe. About half the album, really. And then... We wrote some new ones. You see, we didn't have enough material that we thought was quite ready yet another few years we might dig out the other ones but uh so it was just it was just it was exciting and we were making an exciting noise and there was no reason to stick to the original concept anymore no. memory palaces is that what the first one's called Memory Palaces starts with the what you hear at the beginning of the cassette that I had in my desk for all those years. So you get the sound of play and record being pressed in 1978. There was, it's, it's a really stupid guitar riff and a really stupid lyric, and the combination is fabulous. <laughs> 